It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Paul Mandel to you, who is here from the University of Houston downtown. And I will give you a little bit of information about him. He is an assistant professor of Spanish at, at University of Houston downtown, holds a PhD in Spanish Applied Linguistics, as well as a certificate in Second Language Acquisition and Teacher Education from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. His research includes uh, questions regarding universal grammar, its accessibility in adult second language acquisition, the verb movement, and the processing of morphology by L2 learners of Spanish, which I saw on your website. And I actually um, invited Dr. Mandel to come and speak to us about his online Spanish course. Um, I saw a presentation by him at the SoCalt conference back in April of this year, 2016. And uh, I, I just was so impressed by his presentation and so interested and fascinated by what he's doing with his online course and all of the uh, different uh, techniques he's employed and of course the research behind it, which interests us all very much as we're all trying to create our own online courses here at UT. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Mandel. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. And thank you for the invitation to come up here, especially during um, this dead time in between the end of the semester and, and finals. Um, I've got a question for you. What languages are represented in here? Um, Russian? Urdu? Chinese? Spanish? Portuguese? I know French. Is the majority of the folks here French? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. I'm, I was just curious. One, I, I, one of the things I was sharing a little bit earlier. I'm very honored to be invited to come uh, here because I actually went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign specifically to study with um, a number of people who actually started here, and uh, for whom I hold a great deal of respect and regard. Because I was saying earlier that to me, UT Austin in the early 1980s was actually a, 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 a site in which a number of graduate students and faculty um, were really became interested in applied linguistics with the notion of, OK, what's going on up here? And instead of comparing to, uh, our language learners to native speakers, let's look at the systematicity with which they're doing what they're doing. And so that's, that's the reason, actually, I went to the University of Illinois to study with a number of them that were here, Bill Van Patten and Jim Lee being two of them. But they, they came from here. And I, I hold UT Austin with great esteem because of the, the, the role that this university and, and your departments have played in what we now consider applied linguistics. Um, what I would like to talk, uh, talk about with Dr. Guito's um, invitation is uh, input and meaning in online language instruction. Now, I'll also tell you that I'm a novice when it comes to online language instruction. I came to this because our university was insisting upon it. And um, I, you may find yourselves in, in similar straits where well, this seems to think, be the thing to do, let's do it. And initially, when I was and I serving as an assistant prof professor at the time and the coordinator for the basic language program, I said, I want to go at this from a research-driven and theoretically sound reason. I'm not buying a package just because it's a package. And, I, and so it so happened that I had invited Bill Van Patten and Jason Rothman to give a talk at um, our campus in February of 2014. And I told Bill, I'm working on this. I'm, I'm working on this. I need some help. And he said, I'll help you with this because of some things, some, or some work that he was doing with his graduate students. And so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, I owe to him. He, he allowed us access to these materials. And I understand that through your center, you're working in a group setting because numbers are helpful. I couldn't have done this by myself at all. Um, and so I, I, one of the things I've learned is it has to be a team effort. And so when you were talking about team efforts with online education, open education, to do the kind of work that needs to be available online, you, I, you have to have a large group of people working together. But my question now is, what do they do? OK, and that's what I'd like to speak about. So with this in mind, and this also being the end of the semester, I just like that kind of idyllic scene. Um, what I'd like to talk about um, this morning 
is a brief theoretical motivation about language acquisition, which I wanted to bring to bear in what we were providing in our online classes. Um, secondly, I'm going to, you're going to hear me use the word input, 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 input a lot, because um, all of the research indicates that that's, that's necessary. It's not an option. It has to be there. Um, and then um, I want to talk a little bit about the vocabulary, grammar, and film project that we, we're using in our online classes, the delivery of input online, the method of student response, how they respond to the input, um, and then three types of activities, the grades, and then finally student, student feedback, and at the end, questions and comments. Now, one of the things I also like about this um, is that anytime you have a question, please don't have wait, feel like you have to wait to the end. I'm very much into conversation about this because this is a, a, a project in, 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 in progress. So underlying assumptions of language acquisition. For starters, we all know that the primary reason that most students want to study language is because they want to be able to hear and understand it and have, have a conversation with it. I have had students over and over and over say that that this is the reason because I want to go there or I want to hear or I want to be able to talk with somebody that I either work with or I'm in love with or I want to be in love with. Um, and so, the, or, but I have a connection with that community and I want to be able to use the language. And one of the things I have come to strongly believe about a lot of pedagogical materials is that they're not designed to do that. They're designed to teach people how to read and write. And so you get, I can teach somebody how to read and write Spanish in a semester. I can't teach somebody how to be able to have a conversation, respond appropriately, and interact with um, somebody that speaks Spanish in one semester. That's going to take much more time. And so what I wanted to do with this, this, the, this online course is set it up to be the beginning of what's going to be necessary so that they can hear, understand, and, and express themselves in the language. Um, the second principle is that in order to be able to communicate it requires the development of some type of un underlying mental grammatical representation of the language. And I'm going to make a number of comparisons between what adults do with language development and what infants do with language development. How many of you have been around an infant acquiring a first language? Okay. How many hours, or better yet, days or perhaps weeks or if not months, are they receiving input, meaningful input in the language before they produce their first word? I'm thinking perhaps a year. There's some evidence now that they're actually processing input in utero before they're even born. However, those of us that have been around small children, they understand before they can produce their first language, or per, rather, per, 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 produce their first words. And there are some, there's some studies going on right now, actually, many of you may be familiar with them, where they're actually teaching children, infants, to sign before they actually produce, which is to say that we now know that they're different, <laughs> language is, st is stored in different ways in the brain. And so this is one, uh, one, one um, fact that comes into bearing when we're talking about language development, because it turns out it's the same thing with adults that adults have to have time to process language and, and make these sound meaning or visual meaning connections before they ever ask to produce a word. And so both, um, so how can we use online instruction to help facilitate the development of this online, this, this mental um, grammatical system? Furthermore, the food for this system is the gradual accrual of these sound meaning associations or symbol meaning associations or gesture meaning associations. There's now a growing body of research about people that are um, hearing impaired and what they're doing in terms of the signs and meanings. So they have to de develop this. We, we talk about that in terms of the lexicon, in terms of the development of vocabulary. And those of us that, have, that teach language, you know that, of course, one of, the fo one of the focal components of teaching language is words and teaching words. But uh, there's more and more data showing that you have to do the same thing with grammatical structures and grammatical, grammatical morphemes developing those same kinds of associations the same way you do it with lexical items. Um, and then finally, uh, adult, again, what I was referring to earlier, adult L2 acquisition patterns very similarly in many ways, parallels the development of L1 acquisition. And so how can we incorporate this into what we're developing online? Now, one of the interesting paradoxes to this is that adults already know that they're units. One of the questions that I started out with in graduate school and I wanted to learn about was, how does a child ever realize there's such a thing as a word? Think about it. 
because an adult A already knows, or you can talk to an adult what a word is, and then you can talk up to an adult about, well, there's a difference between a noun and a verb, and then you can, I mean, if you want to get there, you can talk about the difference between mo morphemes and phonemes and whatnot, but an infant consistently, infants consistently develop this ability to realize that there's such a thing as words and to put these units together. How do they do it? Adults already know that they're words, and yet when they start speaking, their speech is very similar to what infants are doing. It may be actually a little bit more developed, but they're, they're still starting out with one word utterances or two word utterances, and those two word utterances are not always subject verb, depending upon the languages. And so it should be easier for adults. And yet I and others strongly believe that this input and the need to be processing input is a necess necessary uh, part of uh, language acquisition. So to that end, okay, you've got this brain up here that has to, it, it, within which part of the information it's developing has to be how to develop the, the, these systems. So you've got input, which is a combination of vocabulary, grammatical morphemes, cultural information that bears meaning and to which the learners have to respond. I use um, Van Patten's definition for input as being meaning-bearing uh, language to which a learner has to respond. Otherwise, it's noise. A subset, and, and I can give you the, the um, bibliographic information if, if you want afterwards, but a subset of that becomes what Van Patten refers to as intake. Many of you may be familiar with Stephen Krashen's work where he said that comprehensible input leads to acquisition. Bill has done a lot of work to um, elucidate that, uh, that model. And so you've got now input, a subset of which becomes intake, which are these meaning, um, meaning structure associations that are incorporated into this developing mental uh, grammar, men mental system. So what we're trying to do is get these into there. And with that, without that in there, output is meaningless. You can get people to produce things. I can teach somebody to sing Italian opera. It sounds beautiful, and they may not have a clue as to what they're saying. In the absence of having these kinds of sound meaning or sign meaning associations, that's what you've got. You've got people doing this production in the absence without, with, 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 with any kind of meaningful um, um, substructure. So what we're using is um, Bill, um, Michael and Greg's Soliviento text in order to, uh, to, to and, and we're using, and again, I have to give him credit, Bill allowed us access to the materials that he had developed with his graduate students at MSU to, um, in, in conjunction with the materials that come with Soliviento, to work with this input. And, and so all of our beginning first and second semester um, activities are a series of different types of input activities. And so those involve um, three different or, or two different types in each chapter, vocabulary focus activities with a very, very um, circumspect grouping of vocabulary. It's not expansive. And the presentation of vocabulary is always me on, on meaning. What does it mean? The explanation, especially for online, the explanations are in English. So that even for second semester, your explanations are in English because you've got somebody sitting at home in front of their computer that, and, and that needs to be as helpful as possible. It's the same reason that I also include um, instruction lines on tests in English because I don't want their confusion from I don't understand the instruction line to come forward as I can't do this activity. And so online explanations for uh, uh, vocabulary and grammar are always going to be in English focusing on the meaning of either lexical items or grammatical items. The type of input are both oral and visual. And you get that both with the presentation, and then you also get it back with the different types of activities that they're doing with them, so that they're getting both types of activity, or activities, both types of input, and they're getting it repetitively, but also with a focus on meaning. In conjunction with this, Bill and, and, his, and his colleagues have put together a film that's called Soliviento in this, uh, in this program. And Soliviento, I'll talk about in a little bit. It's um, similar to um, the, the, it follows the model that he established with Destinos, if you knew with uh, Destinos, okay? Um, 
So you've got both video and aural input based on the structure, uh, the structure about this, this film, okay? Bien. So here you have, for example, um, again, each lesson is going to be divided into three parts, and in each part there are going to be activities back and forth focusing on either vocab uh, vocabulary or a grammatical structure. So you've got a picture. Now, if I were doing this face-to-face, -face, and I use the same materials in our program for face-to-face -face that I do for online, if I were doing this face-to-face, -face, I would f I first use that visual, but I don't have the English words in there. And I'm going to describe um, the items in this particular um, presentation. I'm going to describe them in Spanish. And then I'm going to do a number of, of um, confirmation checks in Spanish. And I'm also not going to have the words in Spanish initially. But if you've got somebody sitting at home by themselves looking at this, they need something to guide together. And so I leave the words in there. In la sala de clase. Classroom objects. Listen to and repeat the following vocabulary items. La luz. Las luces. El reloj. La ventana. La pantalla. So what they're getting is an opportunity to produce font phonetically. Um, but again, it's, I mean, and when I say phonetically, that's part of the repetition of the word. But it's also focusing on what they mean. That's going to start out with this. Then the follow-up activities are going to be based on the same items, but different types of questions about them. So, um, for example, if I were doing this face-to-face, -face, I would turn around and I'd say, okay, I would be doing this in Spanish, but I would point at that and say, um, that's uh, a door. Yes or no? And, or, bueno, es una puerta, sí o no? And I would get confirmation checks by, th by that. The online input activities are doing those same type of activities, but it's actually automatically scored by the system. So it's that, that is providing the input that the person in a face-to-face -face, uh, and, and the confirmation check that a person face-to-face -face would be providing. So that, for example, there might be um, three different pictures, and they see the word, el reloj, and they have to decide A, B, and C, which is the right one. Okay? Or they can do it orally as well. A lot, it's because a lot of it's multiple choice, and a lot of it is, um, and, it, and you can do the same thing actually online with a, Es una pantalla with a picture, and they do see or no. But the whole notion is confirmation checks, and those and that and so that's initially what they're providing, so that they're doing it meaningfully, and they can either do it orally or they can do um, some of them are oral, some of them are, are visual. But it's the whole thing of making those asso associations and checking that they've made the right associations. Okay, that's the same thing. Actually, it's going to happen with the with the grammar. The grammar is going to focus on one particular item. So in this case, it's donde está la biblioteca, an introduction to estar, where we have more than one copular verb in Spanish. Actually, based on the research and the stages of acquisition of the copula that we already know about, this is going to start out using, um, assuming that let's make the, a distinction based on what they're doing with the first and second stages. The first stage is that they don't use a copula at all. The second stage is they use ser in all con context. The third is that they're actually using this thought um, with, with the gerund. So if you know that they're going to do that automatically, the instruction here is focusing on the introduction of this copular based on that. This is using the copular actually with place. Okay? And again, it's focusing on one, and it focuses on one use. And then there are follow-up input activities, uh, comprehension activities based on that. And again, it's a combination of visual and audio input. Um, based on, on this particular grammatical structure. The film that I mentioned is called Soliviento. It's focused on um, a young man, Jaime um, Talavera, who is out of Los Angeles, who works for a, a company that essentially wants to buy a large piece of property in Chile to build um, a, a hydroelectric dam. And in order to do that, if they're successful, it's actually going to back up some waterworks and flood uh, a vineyard that's called Soliviento, which actually exists in the Valle del Maipo. So you've got um, 
throughout the lessons, at the end of every sixth lesson, sixth lesson, there's actually an opportunity to view, or actually at every fourth lesson, there's an opportunity to view a segment of the, um, the film with previewing activities in order to act, uh, activate background schema about the language or about the, the film itself, both from a lexical and a grammatical standpoint. So you've got Jaime Talavera, then you've got Maria Sanchez, who's an anthropologist in Santiago, and then you've got um, Carlos Sanchez, who operates the family vineyard. One of the things I like about all of these activities is not only through the film, and, the stu and students get involved with the film, they've got access to the film on their own, they can see it as many times as they want, the different episodes, but also throughout the film and then also the activities, the speakers in, that are providing input are from a number of different dialectical areas. So they're getting, you're looking at, for example, one particular grouping of lexical items, but they're hearing it produced by a speaker from, a young woman from Madrid, um, somebody from Puerto Rico, somebody else from Argentina, so that they're getting that kind of, or sense of developing a sensitivity to that dialectical variation on this, of the, but using the same lexical items. Here we've got the same thing. Jaime actually um, is a, a, a heritage speaker of Spanish from California who is sent to Chile primarily because um, his boss realizes that he grew up near vineyards and because he speaks Spanish. And so the boss kind of naively says, well, in that case, you can go, you're the perfect per person to go to Chile. And Jaime says in the first episode, I, I, that doesn't qualify me to do this. And so you're also developing an interesting um, notion of cultural sensitivity on the part of the character. Um, but then you've also got a number of different um, speech variations in Chile involved in, in this. And there's a love story and, and, and whatnot, and develop family attend, uh, uh, connections and whatnot. Um, so you've got this developing system, and you're, and you're trying to get all of these different types of input in there. The question that many people ask is, what about the output? And where are they going to do the output? Well, the output that they're getting in, uh, that they're producing initially from the first half of, my first, of the first semester is basically confirmation checks. They are producing phonetically, as we saw with the lexical items, but in terms of anything meaningful, it's the comprehension checks. Do you understand this? Can you pick the right one? Are you making the right associations? At about the midpoint of the semester, we start doing what we call diarios. And diarios are journal entries that they get a prompt question that's related to the topic of, the, of what they've been uh, um, communicating about. And so the first one could be something like, um, um, in Spanish, of course, describe, your, describe a typical Monday. What do you do on a typical Monday? And one of the things I also tell them at the beginning of, before assigning this is that you're going to be frustrated by doing this because you're all are young adult, native, most native speakers of English or native speakers of another language. You could write multi-clausal treatises about anything in your L1 or L2. One and L2, depending. I've got I've got people studying Spanish with me that speak four languages and are from small countries in, in Africa, and they get the same fr frustration. You're going to find though that initially in Spanish, you're going to find yourself writing single clausal um, sentences, and it's going to sound kind of stilted, and it's going to sound very a very ele elementary school. Don't worry about it. And so, I uh, reassure them, and I say here. Write to me about, answer this question, tell me something about yourself, and um, use the structures, the lexical items we've been using or the grammatical items to exp and ex explain or to address this question. I will respond to your journal entry according to content. I'm not going to make it bleed red. I'm not checking the grammar. One. The only way I'd respond to the grammar is if it's unintelligible. And then I'll ask a question. But then I respond in Spanish to their journal entries. I ask them some questions. I make some comments about what they've written. So for example, um, and this is a second semester course where they were asked, what do you like to do in your free time? And this student writes a second semester. And mi tiempo libre me gusta dibujar. I like uh, drawing. Do I need to do the translation? Yes? OK. In my free time, I like drawing. I also like watching video games. I also like going to the uh, gym to do, to do exercises. In the gym, I run on a, 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 a treadmill, thank you. Um, and, I also, and I also lift weights, OK? That, I'm pretty impressed with that. 
for a second semester Spanish learner whose first language is English. Okay, so my response is, bueno, en fin de cuentas, que dirías? Okay, um, at, at the end of the day, what would you say? Um, do you lead a, a sedentary life or an active life? And I say that because that was actually the initial question that was prompted of, of, of okay, using these activities. He never really got around to doing that. But I'm not going to say, bad student. No, I'm just going to say, let's, let's go back and think about the question, shall we? And, I, and then I say, a mi, to, okay, I like to go to the gym regularly too. I go to the gym three or four times a week. There I walk or I run three miles a day to do exercise, uh, aerobic exercise. Afterwards, I lift weights a little bit. Sometimes I go to an aerobics uh, exercise class just, to, just to, to change things up a little. And at times I run or I, I, but sometimes running or walking bores me. Um, do you go to an uh, aerobic exercise class uh, from time to time? And what I enter into with these students is actually a dialogue in writing. Now, this they can control a little bit better than they could if it was just all oral. So I encourage them, use the structures and use the grammar that we've been studying. The way I score these are one or zero. One, if you have used the structures that we've been focusing on to express yourself in a meaningful way. I am not interested in how well you can use a dictionary. So if I see any kind of terminology that's not part of the, of the, the then, and that usually takes care of that, that translator, the, the online translator, because it can come up with all sorts of structures that they've never been exposed to. Exactly, exactly. And I'm also telling them, and I am expecting language coming out of a second, first or second semester Spanish learner. I don't care what your friend Maria in Guatemala can write about. So if I get, for example, si hubiera podido ir al supermercado, habría compra, uh-uh. If I'm getting those kind of structures, no. And I tell them, for, to get credit for this, it has, you have to have something where it's exp you're expressing yourself with the grammatical items and the lexical items that we've been studying. What I know that a first or second Spanish learner can, can do. And if it's out of that, you're not going to get credit. The interesting thing is, and I don't know if you all come up with this as well, and we're trying to work with this. Every once in a while you get a heritage speaker of Spanish is like, this is going to be the ECA. Um, it's not. It, well, they, they do, well, they get frustrated because part of this is also content. There are a series of notas culturales, and they're expected, I mean, that's, they're responsible for that information as well. It's very difficult to take somebody with a very advanced, developed mental grammar and force them to write like they were in first grade. And according to the way this rubric is set up, if you turn into some, something into me that is not written like that, you're not going to get credit for it. And that's what, and, and so, I, and that's in the syllabus. That's not me being mean to you. And so that kind of takes care of it, uh, s sort of. And I tell students at the beginning, we've also got a structure set up in ours that if you're a heritage speaker, we've got other courses for you. You can take this placement exam for free. And if you pass this course, you're going to get the credit from all of these. So why are you sitting in this class? So we're trying, we're, we're trying to deal with it that way. Okay, so so that's the kind of way I'm, that's that's the kind of response I'm going to give. Then here's another one. Um, this was um, the, again, what kind of exercises do you do? Are you and these this was the prompt here, okay? That for the same and it's, and this this student was in the same class and she comes back with I say she because I know who it is. Um, I don't like exercising much. I walk to the refrigerator for a beer, <laughs> and maybe something to snack on. Um, my son likes to play golf and. I look to, I, I like to too, but I'm bad at it. My uh, boyfriend and I go scuba diving. I don't know the words for scuba diving in Espanol, and that's safe. I'm o I'm okay with that. No sé cómo se dice. I'm like okay. Um, sometimes I do um, stationary bike, but because I like um, burning calories and I like sweating. I'm but I'm not but I'm not an athlete. I really love um, football, South American football, with a lot of beer and food. Um, we watch it on television, especially the, the uh, World Cup. What I really like, I'm like, two, two paragraphs. I'm like, go. This is the second semester. Two paragraphs. My favorite exercise is traveling. My boyfriend and I, in April, are going to Guatemala. Um, I'm happy because I, I, I've traveled to Guatemala uh, in the past. Um, <laughs> parenthetical. I was mugged uh, in the first two hours there, but that's another long story. Um, <laughs> We have friends that have a big house there in Antigua, and they said, come visit our house free. 
the house is, is, is being, or would sell for $1.2 million in the state, but it hasn't sold yet, um, et cetera. I'm really impressed with that from a second. And this particular student, I also happen to know, is a non-traditional student who was terrified. And this was the second semester she had taken this class with me. She told, she sent me a long email message at the very beginning of first semester of, I'm not a traditional student. I'm terrified about this. It's been years since I've taken a language. And I, I'm, I'm very afraid. This is the last, these are the last two classes I have to take to, to finish my degree. And I'm afraid I'm going to fail them. And then I'm getting this out of her in her second semester. And not only, and so I respond to her similarly, but then she also includes pictures. Of, of her travels. And so this is where I see them engaging meaningfully in this kind of output that they can produce and that they can, they can control and they can work with. And so from a very beginning, that's what I'm looking for for output and meaningful output. Their language, their oral language is going to be stilted at best. You're, going, you're, you're getting something meaningful here that they can, that, 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 that they are using what the, this mental system that they're developing in order to express themselves um, meaningfully. Again, like I said, most of these materials, there's no way I could have done all of this by myself as an assistant professor. And so I'm very thankful to, 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 to Bill and his graduate students to be able to develop these. What I'm trying to add now are opportunities to, for the student to student part and both orally and visually. And I'll show you how, what, what we're working on with that. Um, but not, not yet, not right now. Um, however, I do want, I don't want you to get away, to go away thinking, well, the students are just sitting there by themselves. What they're getting in the way of input, they're getting input from a number of different speakers, um, oral input that they have to respond to. So they're not just getting me, but they're getting, um, within the confirmation checks, they're getting a young woman from Spain who's, who's, who's providing some of the input. They're getting uh, another young man from Mexico who's providing. So they are getting input. It's not like they're sitting there totally by themselves and not getting anything at all. And so it's not just me and them, but it's me and then these other people that have provided this, these in, this type of input. They're not yet interacting with other people in class. And there's, and, um, there's a reason why I want to get more of that. But it's more from the structure of online instruction and the online community uh, data than it is necessarily from the, the SLA data. Um, for the four types of scars, OK, we've got three different types of input activities, parte A, parte B, and tarea activities. And these are all based on either a vocabulary focus or a grammatical focus. And they're all actually self-scored. So they get automatic response. Now, one of the things I realized when I started this, uh, thinking about teaching online, I actually have some friends that are at different universities around Texas. And I started talking to them about how they, uh, how they interact with their classes. And you may already know about this. It was news to me. They, the people that are doing classes online frequently are interacting with them in a completely different way than if they're coming to a face-to-face -face class. In a face-to-face -face class, I've got a very structured thing. We're going to do this on Monday, and we're going to do this on Wednesday, and we're going to do this on Friday, and we're going to continue that for 15 weeks. A lot of the students, I learned that a lot of the students that are doing the online classes are sitting down and doing long stretches. And, they're, they, they, and they want to get into it, which really gets, and, and, and you may have one student that's following you if you've got it set up on a regular basis, but you've got other students that may be three weeks ahead, which that's one of the things I learned when I was trying to think about how do you do the synchronous versus asynchronous kind of work. And I, for to do online like this, I'd rather make it right now asynchronous. If you can do it and you can mate up to it, there'll be certain points where you have to provide some kind of feedback. But try, trying to do that synchronous part right now for this type of class, it's, it's, it's different if I were doing a content course and we were all going to get together and, and, and we all had parts of, a, of, of, a, of a, um, some type of research project and we're all going to bring them together because we need to do something. That's not, not what they have to do with this. That's not the nature of this. And so I'm trying to uh, allow for that because I've also had students express frustration when they can't work ahead on their own space, especially with this. Another thing that we have, at least uh, at UHD, with first and second semester students, is we may have students that had two years of high school Spanish. 
this is helping refresh and, and reconnect all of the connections and the lexical connections in this underlying system. So that they don't need that much time. And so it allows for some kind of flexibility this way. The other thing, when I first set this course up and piloted it, I had it very structured such that a lesson would come live on a Monday morning at midnight, and it would stay live until Wednesday at noon. Another lesson would come live at Wednesday at midnight and stay live until Friday at noon, et cetera, so that they'd have 60 hours to do potentially each lesson. 98% of what I did that first semester was deal with extensions and, 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 and that kind of aspect of reconfiguring the course from, from a calendar standpoint. It had nothing to do with content. And so after going to a couple of other national conferences and talking to other folks using similar materials, it's all open on day one, all the way to the end of the semester. And I've told them that from day one, you could do to the end of the semester in a week if you, I wouldn't advise it, I don't think it's a good idea, but you could, theoretically. However, things are going to close on a consistent basis, and they close Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And the dates are available to them from the very beginning. And they're all due by noon. And, and there will be no extensions. So if you know something's coming up, you can work ahead. But don't ask for an extension because it's not happening. Because it's been a bit open to you from the first day of the semester all the way through. And the responses as far as accessing, re requesting extensions this past semester, I had two. And, uh, and that was for a second semester course. And so that, that seems to work out much better. If there is an extenuating circumstance, and every once in a while there is, and there has to be some type of evidence to support it, I can go into the system and recheck and, and re-extend it. But that what I was getting beforehand was what I would call superfluous. I didn't feel well this morning, and no, that's not happening. Mm -mm. I'm sorry you didn't feel well this morning, but this has been open for three weeks, so. Mm -mm. So um, the other thing about these activities is that they get automatic response to them. And so they're self-scored in the system. They have three chances to do each input activity. So what they do is they focus on the presentation that we saw at the beginning with the explanation in English, work with that. Then they, they have three opportunities to do these input activities. The first time, and all three will be scored, the first time the feedback that they get are the number that they got right. The second time is the number that they got right. The third and final time is the number that they got right and all the right answers. So what I'm encouraging them to do is if you didn't get 100%, go back and look at the initial presentation and check yourself there. Um, you, and what the, the way this is, the, the system is set up is and we, the system will take your highest score. So even if you start out with a C in terms of the number of things you got right, you have an opportunity to go back and look and check and, and, and redo it. And the final time, you'll, it will tell you what the responses are. And initially, I mean, at the beginning of the semester, there may be some questions about that. And what I do is I respond to them and say, keep an eye on this, and don't forget to go back and look at this, and, this, and that this is different from. And actually, they get more opportunities to do this online than they would if it was face to face. And face to face, you get one time to turn it in. Right. And here, you've got some opportunity to work with it. And every time they do it, it's providing more input, visual and oral. So that, I mean, it's designed to develop this. Now, with this in mind, are you all sitting down? There are no tests. Okay? The way this is structured is that they're going to get so many points for each one of these activities. And the final grade is the accrual of the relative number of points scored over the full amount possible across the semester. Now you're going to say, well, how do you know that they know what they're doing? If you think about it all, especially at a beginning language level, everything that they're getting in Spanish is dependent upon and relative to what they've already had, so that a lot of these input activities become definition activities of can you define this according to the other language that you, or can you check? So you have to be able to understand what you're doing in order to do this. And so the test is in the system in the accrual of points. It's a different notion of, of, how, of how, to, how to grade, per se. So instead of having a, here, can you produce this one? No. As you go across, you're not, if you're not paying attention to what things mean, it's going to show long before you, you would have a test anyway. Okay.
um, bien. This is the reason why the, uh, the lexical items, are, are the collection of lexical items are very focused. So that it's building on what, it's, what, what you've already had. I remember once years ago when a student asked me, Dr. Mandel, is the final exam in first semester Spanish comprehensive? And I said, I would be hard pressed to give you a final exam that didn't involve stuff from the first lesson. I'm not sure I could do that. Yes. Uh, so, but it, the, same, the same notion is expressed through here, that the whole thing is, is I mean, it's building on itself. Okay. Then the diarios, again, they get oh, two scores, a one or a zero. One, if you've addressed the question. One, if it's language, if you've used the language to express yourself and I've learned something about you. And one, if it doesn't sound like somebody else did it. Even if it, and I don't really care, uh, grammatically, there are things I can, I'm, I'm expecting to see prob to be problematic. And if they're not, then I'm like wondering about that. But um, so I'm, it's not bleeding red, it's not a grammar exercise, and I'm not, I'm not rewriting things. All I'm doing is responding to the content of what they've written. And the students really get into it. And again, does the entry address the question? Is this language to be expected from a beginning, uh, beginning language student? Okay. Um, and I actually end up getting into a conversation with students because they'll get a new prompt every other week. They're, they're, I, they're assigned every other week. And so the first semester, they do four of them after midterm. The second semester, they think, I think they do seven total. But then, I, again, as you saw, I'm putting questions in there. So many of the students are responding to the questions that I've asked before. Some of them send them as follow-ups, even before the next uh, uh, journal is due. And I respond. And we get into a conversation that way. So they're getting input, meaningful input back and forth. From, they're learning something about me. I'm learning something about them. And we're developing a rapport that way. Um, it's interesting. One of the things I also, I, I remember years ago doing a family tree activity. And so I'm describing my family tree and they're drawing it. And suddenly I heard one student in English say to another student, he's actually describing his real family. Yeah. And they were surprised by this. And to me, it's important to be real. And so I'm telling them about my family. I'm telling them about my dog. I'm telling them about what I do. And, and, and which leads them to invest even more, which is, if you think about it, language is about community, it's about culture, it's about connections. Um, actful, five Cs. Um, so th that's what we're doing by doing this. I'm not creating some other world that's a fictitious world about what Senor Mandel does. No, I'm telling you, this is what my family's like, and my parents are divorced, and my mother died, and this, that, and the other. And what that does is it gives them the, 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 the lexical items necessary to talk about their families. And also to realize, wait a minute, I'm not the only one that my parents are divorced. So that's important to me when it comes to input and language development. Um, and again, so you get the total numbers of, of, of scores accrued. Now one of the questions that comes up with this, and I've talked to a number of, of colleagues about this, um, I don't know about y'all, but yes, I'm from Georgia. I don't know about y'all, but every once in a while, um, the technical aspect of what I'm doing online doesn't work. And I get a student who writes a message of, oh my god, is this, gonna, is this gonna sacrifice my A because this didn't work on the online? So what I do is I tell them at the beginning, okay, we know that there'll be technical glitches from time to time because that's just in the nature of the beast. So at the end of the semester, what I'm going to do is on each one of those parts that's online, I'm going to add 10 points to each one of them. with a, And I mean percentages. So that if you scored a 73, I'm going to count that as an 83. That alleviates this frustration and concern when something doesn't work technically. Because before I was doing that, they would get angry. And I'd get these furious, this is going to, I'm, I'm so, so my, my grade's suffering from this and it's your fault. No. And what I do is, I, I mean, I proactively tell them sometimes there are glitches in the technical system, no matter how perfect it is. So don't worry about them. Let me know when it happens so that I can address it and look into it. But also rest assured that at the end of the semester, there will be 10 percentage points added to these scores so that to, to make up for that and for your inconvenience with a ceiling of 100. I'm not going to give somebody 110, 120%. No, that's not going to happen. But that alleviates that concern. And students like, oh, OK, fine. And so Dr. Mandel, this didn't work on this particular activity. Could you look at that? Sure. And it completely alleviates the, the, the anger that I was getting online. 
Um, so again, a plus 10% to adjust for technical glitches. And I do that at the end of the semester. Yes, yes, yes. Because I just, I haven't seen anything that's 100% working totally. And I don't want that frustration to get in the way in the effect of the effectiveness of the course. I don't want that to get in the way. Um, and it's been well received by students. Nobody's gotten 175 percent yet. And if that, I mean, if that happens, I'll, I'll come back and revisit that. But right now, that serves a purpose. Okay. Now, student responses. How have students responded to this course? Well, this is the end of the semester comments that I got from one one semester. I enjoyed this class. I find the use of the movie to be a valuable tool in hearing the language and being able to see what the actors were doing while speaking in Spanish. This made it easier to decipher words that might have been unfamiliar. I'm looking forward to taking Spanish 1402. Like, cha-ching, okay, good. Um, second, Dr. Mandel was as engaged in this course as I thought he would be. He had a look at the syllabus response to all the questions I had. My other professor in other course really wants you to learn. I didn't get that feeling from Dr. Mandel. This is a very difficult course for someone who never spoke Spanish, and his response uh, was always look at the syllabus. I know who did that, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm including this on purpose because he didn't look at the syllabus, and he didn't actually engage this course until about the seventh week. And so when he, the questions he was asking, I was explaining, but I was also saying, go back and look at the syllabus. One of the reasons I said that is that part of what they're supposed to do in the first three days of, core, of class and their step-by-step -step instructions online is look at the syllabus, do this and this and this, in order to be able to engage online activities. And also, we use Blackboard as our, as our platform, and our activities are in Connect. If they don't do this, it doesn't sync the two things together, and none of the work that they do will show up in their Blackboard grades. I can't do that. And so he obsessed on that and stopped on that, and I'm really sorry about that, but I'm also going to be real, and I'm not going to erase that. I mean, it happened. It happens. I'll own it. Okay. Third one. Awesome instructor. Made up for the second one. Um, <laughs> fourth one. I really enjoyed this class. I learned a lot. I look forward to taking you next semester in 1402. This is my first time taking Professor fifth time taking Professor Mandel, and I must say I really enjoyed taking his online Spanish class. He made it really interesting and made learning Spanish a little easier. I'll be I'll be taking this course in uh, spring. Great professor. I really enjoyed taking this course. I'm really pleased with those. I don't know about, I mean, and so this tells me this, that this is working for these students and, and we're interfacing, and this is give, and, and, and so I'm pleased with, with this kind of, of, of feedback um, being. Um, extra thoughts. One of the things I've learned is the importance of immediate feedback. With face-to-face -face classes, I tell students, Send me an email message, and you'll get a response within 36 hours. Email, I don't know about y'all, but email to me is not a telephone. I also tell students that if you've got a question five minutes before class begins, or even a half an hour before class begins, bring it to class. Because if you've got it, so do other people, and we need to talk about it in a group. But if you send me a message five minutes before class, I'm, not, I'm probably not going to see it. Online is different. Online, I feel a need that... I will respond to those, to, those, to those email messages within 12 hours, if not faster, within 12. Because if you think about it, they're sitting at home in front of the computer, wherever, and I don't want them to feel like they're there by themselves. And so I actually screwed up. There was uh, the second semester we were doing this. I got behind, and those evaluations that I showed you just before got real <clears throat> because students felt like he's not here. We don't know who we're talking to. We're in this room by ourselves. And so that's important to me, OK? Um, I also have, I use specific forms of address when I'm interacting with students in these email messages. When I'm thinking about the, it, the research that's been done about incidental learning that they're not even focused on. So I start out with things like estimado Juan o estimada Elena. And I, what, whatever they respond to, and they also learn something about Spanish um, e-communication et etiquette this way. But I'm always going to respond this way. Um, and then I st the, first, the first sentence is always, gracias por tu mensaje. And then I'll respond, e depending on the level, I make respond, continue responding in Spanish, or I'll respond in English. But I'm always going to start out with, estimado o estimada, gracias por tu mensaje. They learn that. 
And they're also, um, look what they're also picking up. They're picking up things like punctuation, okay? This isn't the focus of the lesson, but they're getting it, okay? And then I sign it cordialmente, un saludo cordial, or what have you. And they, and they start, by the end of the semester, that's the way they are addressing me in email messages. And I'm like, cool. Um, and then um, what we're working on now, as I mentioned before, is the addition of oral feedback through voice thread, thanks to Georges de Thibault, okay? Um, so what we're, what we're working on structuring is visual prompt, audio prompt, and studio audio prompt. So we've got something like this. There will be one of these per lesson, okay? And it's, um, ahora te toca, it's your turn. Answer the question you, you, you hear about Anastasia's family and then ask another for a classmate to answer. You'll receive one point for an accurate answer and one point for a well-formed, pardon me, well-formed appropriate question. Notice again that the instruction lines are in English, but the activity is going to be in Spanish, okay? And you'll forgive me for this because I was doing this on the fly and it's kind of stilted, but. I'm still getting used to the idea of being videoed. I'm, I'm stilted that way. But again, if you don't speak Spanish, what, I, what I'm basically saying is, okay, now it's your turn. Um, look at this. Look at this family tree and ask. A, uh, answer the question I'm asking, and then ask. Leave a question for somebody else. And so the question was, what is the relationship between Fausto and Anastasia? And they can come back with Fausto is the grandfather of Anastasia, or Anastasia is the granddaughter of Fausto. It doesn't matter as long as it makes sense. And then they'll leave another question. One of the um, and and so you'll end up with a string of of these, which will be uh, scored. Um, essentially that you did it and that your question that your answer is right and that your question is right. I'm not looking for, for, for perfect phonology or, or any, anything like that. That the struct, structuring it this way actually encourages students to do it faster even if there's a longer deadline because the number of potential questions get smaller and smaller and smaller as you go down the list because you can't repeat the question. And so you you'll get students like immediately they're on that like Got to get on there because okay, this it's because it's easier at the beginning than it is later on. So they won't. I will. I will jump in, but they also they won't get that because there are going to be a number of the point. The 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 the, the scoring is that you ask answered the question accurately and that you asked a question. So you've got a possibility of zero, one, or two. And so I'm going to score that and then step in and 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 periodically I'm going to look through them. You can't repeat the question, so you have to go back and find out which question which relations have already been asked. So you, I know which one I can, because you're not going to get points for it. If you go back to the vocabulary presentation, this is the family that's used to, to initially talk about uh, terminology about family. And so it goes back to, it's tying back into the text. They can't do this directly with a text open because there are other relationships involved here. But I mean, these are people that they're getting to know. And then it starts out with a nuclear family and then it grows and then there's also their pets involved and whatnot. And, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so this is what we're working on in order to get some oral. But again, um, there'll be one of these per, um, per, per lesson. So I think they're like six for first semester and six for second semester. And I'm actually working with a couple of my colleagues to do this so it's not just one person doing it. And again, this is the idea of dialectical differences because um, my, my Spanish is, 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 is not the same as my colleagues from El Salvador or from Spain. Okay, many thanks. Um, I've got some uh, references, and thank you for your time. And if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. So thank you.